Yeah, thanks, Dan. I um, have been a member of the Sydney Anglican Church for most of my life. Um, and uh, I worked at a Christian school teaching English from 2017 to 2019, and I loved it. Um, I think I was really good at my job, and mm. I really enjoyed the colleagues and the um, relationships with students that I had. Um, and in January this year, um, the school, which is actually in Mr. Felinski's um, electorate, fired me. And um, they fired me because I'm gay, and they fired me because um, they disagreed with me that you can be Christian and also live true to the biological realities of your sexuality or gender. Can, can I just clarify that, Steph? Do you believe that you were fired because you were gay or because you could no longer teach the ethos or the doctrine of that school? Or had you offered to do just that? I had offered to um, promote the school's ethos on sexuality, um, obviously notwithstanding um, things that I believe would be harmful to the students, but I did offer to back the school's position on a lot of things. Um, however, um, the school wasn't willing to engage in debate on that and um, they terminated my employment because of my sexuality and my belief that it's OK to be gay, that God's cool with it. OK, I'll put that question to, to you, Michael Jensen. Um, this goes to the nub of the issue, and that is where rights contest, where someone's right to their sexuality and right to employment contest uh, with the religious freedom or the religious expression or the ethos of a religious school. How do we resolve that? Well, it's complicated, right? What we've got to do in a liberal society, in open societies, we've got to make room for uh, for um, different types of different types of view, different types of expression. One of the things with uh, religious groups is that they're not just individuals; they're necessarily communities that uh, express their ethos by by shared statements of faith and shared uh, working working together. Um, the, the current legislation that's uh, before the parliament deals with belief. Um, and so it, it deals specifically with an with a, with a issue of whether you, you sign up to a, a, belief, a belief statement or not, rather than uh, saying anything about someone's identity or their, or their behaviour. It says, in particular, it de deals with that. Um, but, uh, but because there are, difficult, there are difficult cases, does not mean that we shouldn't promote the, the, the freedom of re religious groups and religious institutions to be able to employ who they want to employ, uh, reasonably um, and with, with clarity about their, their doctrinal statements and doctrinal positions. But, but Steph's sitting here tonight, what do you say to Steph, who is a Christian and still hold a Christian faith despite this experience? Yeah, I've obviously had to rethink a lot of things and I do believe that I have a very well-researched and well-thought-out stance on a lot of the, um, the Christian doctrines that I have believed and some of which I continue to believe and some of which I've changed my mind about. I think um, with, with good sort of academic backing. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's troubling that the Christian community in Sydney broadly does not seem to be open to the fact that I can belong there too. Mm. But that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue for the Christian community to, to talk about and for you to contribute to, the, to that, that particular theological debate. But the, the issue at law is whether there is freedom for a Christian, for a particular community to, to express its identity in that particular way too, isn't it? And, and Jason, that goes to the, the point of the legislation. I mean, this happened in, in your electorate, so Steph, the, the school was in your electorate. Is this the sort of thing we would see more of under this legislation that a school would be able to say, you don't fit the ethos of this school, mm. therefore we can pay? Mm. So, so Stan, um, the first point I would make is this occurred before this legislation was even written. So that's the first thing. And, and Steph, can I say to you that um, that was that what you've gone through, no one should have to go through. So to the extent that it's, it's not worth much, I'm sorry you've had to go through that. Um, what I would say, though, um, about this legislation is that as a, as a liberal, a philosophical liberal, I believe that the role of the state is to maximise the freedom of individuals wholly consistent with the freedom of others. Now, we talk a lot about in Parliament about the economy, about infrastructure, about climate change. These things are about the su sustaining life. What Steph um, is, has gone through, what Steph believes, what people of faith um, believe are the things that make life worth sustaining. The role of any government is to ensure that those things are protected because if our nation is to mean anything, people need to be free to express themselves within that context. What we are trying to do here is very difficult. 
because, as I'm sure Andrew is about to tell everyone, you have intersections where mm. people, where you have faith um, coinciding with people's personal identities and beliefs. They are difficult things. They need to be encoded in law so that people are protected and so that those freedoms are ensured. Let, let me bring in um, Andrew. And the point being here, Andrew, is that there is a... Uh, you know, federally, there are laws against discrimination on the basis of race or gender or sexuality, but not religion. Something is missing, isn't it? Well, I think religious protections are well covered uh, within state and territory, uh, anti-discrimination but, but, law. But, and... but not federally, and that's the point here. And, and not in and, New South Wales. And, and not, in, not in all states. Or South Australia. So is there a need... Is that the piece that's missing? If, if you can be protected for discrimination against on the basis of race or gender or sexuality, why not protection of religious expression? Well, that, that's a, a fair point, but it depends on how it's framed. So I would suggest look at the ACT Human Rights Act uh, as a very effective way uh, to provide those religious protections. But to Steph's question, um, I, I'm just so sorry to hear that, Steph. Um, that's terrible. I, come and teach in Canberra. You are really <laughs> welcome in our city. We will value you for who you are and the wonderful professional skills you could bring to our education system. Well, although one, and I'm one, sorry you've been discriminated against. It's terrible. It shouldn't happen. Once that, once that law, if it is indeed ultimately is passed in this form, um, would that not override the laws that you have in the ACT? And what recourse would you seek? Because I understand in Victoria mm. there's potential of a High Court challenge. Is that what you'd look at as well? Well, we'd have to consider uh, our, our legal position. We're in a, a constitutionally weaker position as a, as a territory, but we have a Human Rights Act and a Discrimination Act that provide uh, excellent protection that, uh, for people uh, of religious faith, but balance those rights uh, and ensure that you know, everyone is equal before the law. That's the sort of Australia that I want to live in. And, and in my part of Australia, in Canberra, that's the law and that's where we're all equal before the law in the ACT. That's how it should be everywhere. But, Melinda, that goes to the nub of the issue here. We talk about equality, we talk about people being equal before the law. Let's wind this back a little bit and to the case that really got people fired up about this and what we've seen eventuate, and that is the Israel Folau case. Um, a bit of background is rugby union player, um, who had, a Christian who had posted things about homosexuals, um, fornicators, adulterers, um, drunkards, on and on, who were going to go to hell, he said. They're condemned to hell. He then lost his job, effectively. Should he have lost his job for what was an expression of a fundamentally held faith? And how do you deal with that in a workplace environment? Can I say, firstly, just, just on the last question, I think this is one of the concerns I have with where we're at right now. Um, and you're already seeing businesses and business groups sort of reflecting that they're not sure how this plays out um, and how they're going to deal mm. with this and what the implications for them are as they deal with the laws and, and, and the regulations of this. If I come back to the Israel Folau issue, the question I've always had on that is, um, and it's, it's a bit of my concern on this issue as well around... Um, I think, I, I personally, philosophically, I'm in support of free speech as well, but I think it comes with a huge responsibility. And the question I've always had, quite frankly, about those comments is why? Why were you saying them? Why did they have to be say, said in that way? Where was the reflection on who you were talking to? Why you were, why you were making those statements? Um, and where was the reflection on the potential impact and harm for people? And, and, and weighing those things up and balancing those things. So that's... That's a little bit of my concern around where, where does the balance lie in this in terms of your responsibility to think about other human beings, the things that you're saying and how you say them. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it's a really fundamental issue. Yeah, yeah where do you sit on this? Uh, you know, Israel Folau at the time had said he believed this was an expression of his faith, firmly held, and he said an expression of love. He said he wanted to save people and he felt compelled to say this. He stood by his comments. He ultimately paid... Um, a price for that as well. We're all talking about these rights, these contested rights. Steph has paid a price for this. And where rights are contested, where do we fall on free speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of your own identity in a pluralist, secular society that is still bounded by religion and faith as a, as a central tenet of our societies? 
I think um, Andrew Barr was right when he said that we're mostly covered when it comes to religious discrimination laws, and that was actually mm -hmm. what was found by the Philip Ruddock government review mm -hmm. on this very issue. Um, he said we didn't actually need to do anything on religious discrimination. We're well covered. Um, now, Scott Morrison bringing this in and saying it was an election promise from three years ago... Which, which he didn't get a mandate for. He won the election. He also said three years ago that he was going to bring in a federal integrity commission. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Bridget Archer, the Tasmanian Liberal MP who crossed the floor today to support an independent proposal for a federal ICAC of sorts, uh, spoke for many Australians when she said she found it offensive that we're prioritising a religious discrimination bill which is not needed when there are so many other pressing issues we could be looking at, like a Federal Integrity Commission. It's certainly been a pressing issue for you, Steph. Um, uh, do you think you've any clearer tonight after the discussion or has it just raised more questions? I have a lot of questions about yeah. it, Stan. May I address Reverend Dr Jensen with my yeah, question? Yes, just, just quickly. Sure. I've written this one for you, Michael. As a learned and, learned and experienced leader in the Sydney Anglican Church, do you believe it's OK for churches and Christian organisations like the school that fired me to be legally protected in excluding and denouncing certain people in order to preserve a very narrow interpretation of theological correctness? Well, I don't, I don't believe it's... Uh, I don't think there should be protection for, uh, for abusive behaviour or being... Uh, or the, you know, and I've got to say, I think the, the issue uh, where you've experienced particular discrimination goes to the Sex Discrimination Act as well, which needs clarification. It's out, that's way out of date. I do think that Christian organisations ought to be able to teach traditional marriage, as traditional marriage has been um, taught by ma the majority of Christians over, the, over 2,000 years and is still uh, believed by many Australians. I think they shouldn't do that with, uh, without compassion, without, uh, and, and they shouldn't do that in an offensive, uh, in an offensive or vilificatory way. But I do believe that they should be able to teach uh, and hold to traditional marriage, yes. But Steph, no one's stopping them from doing it. Steph, th th thank you so much for, um, for, um, for your question Thanks. as well. Good luck with your, um, your teaching career. <laughs>